This is shocking. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And our lead story today, the unthinkable, is about to decimate a major economy. And the problem is when they go down, they're going to pull everyone with them. We're going to show you who this is and why what's plaguing their economy is soon to be plaguing everyone else's. Plus, we have a sponsor for today's show, New Gen Medical Devices. You can find them on the OTC under the symbol NGMDF and on the TSXV under the symbol NGMD. This company is revolutionizing needle-free delivery. And if you're looking for an early opportunity with massive potential, well, be sure to stay tuned to the end of the show or check out the pinned comment or description for more information. Now, let's head to Bloomberg where we picked today's story up with a headline, a German factory malaise deepens as activity unexpectedly down and the hope around all the world with the central elites and the political elites was that the services sector was going to pull the global manufacturing sector out of its slump. We made the case that Germany's manufacturing sector was in a depression and then it moved up to just a mere recession. We said this isn't going to last. It's going to roll over and it's going to head lower. And when it does, it's going to take their economy out. It's going to take all the peripheral nations around the Eurozone with them and it's going to spread like wildfire across every other major economy and sure enough it's starting and here we can see we just got the flash composite pmi or purchasing managers index this is now in contraction territory again it's at the four month low of 46 but that's not the biggest part here if we look at the manufacturing pmi as itself it's at 42.3 this is depression territory and this of course comes back from january's 45.5 where everyone had hope that the global economy was turning around we said look there's just no chance this is going to happen but everyone has been pinning their hopes on the services sector here and here you can see even that is actually just slightly better but still in contraction at 48.2 and what no one was really expecting here is that the services sector was not strong enough to pull the manufacturing base up nobody seemed to understand that but as we look deeper into the german data we can see how just easily this is going to spread all around the world because February saw a further drop in business activity across the Eurozone's largest economy in a continuation of the downturn that began in the middle of last year. The latest flash PMI survey compiled by S&P 500 Global, or not S&P 500, but S&P Global showed the rate of contraction quick and slightly, led by a sharp and accelerated reduction in manufacturing output. Demand for goods and services continued yet to weaken, although employment held broadly steady as firms expressed slightly more optimism toward the year ahead outlook. So here we continue to see signs that demand is getting worse it's shrinking but yet employers don't want to believe that they are hopeful that all it will take is the central banks cutting rates a little bit and that next thing you know the economy is going to become roaring back to life but even under the covers here as we look further in this report we don't see any signs of hope for manufacturing at all and as was the case with output, new business in the German private sector declined at the quickest pace for four months as reports from surveyed firms highlighted general reluctance among customers amid economic uncertainty and tight financial conditions. And this is all a case because what do we continue to see is total compensation growth continues to slow. Even though employees are getting inc wage increases, what they're not getting is enough hours to back that up. So we're seeing demand continue continue to fall here and yet everyone hopes that something magical is going to happen and turn all of this around but yet new orders fell across both monitored sectors but particularly sharply in manufacturing where the rate of contraction accelerated markedly from the previous month to the fastest since last november there was further broad-based decrease in new export business. Of course, we know that China is one of Germany's biggest export partners, and that is a factor because China's economy is slowing as well. So here we can see that new order demand continues to shrink. That is broadly consistent with a lack of demand in the economy. This eventually leads to layoffs, but the employment sector there, well, they're just not ready to do that. And that might be because even though there's a reduced intake of new orders, it's leading to a sustained decline in backlogs of work across the private sector in February. The survey data showed resilience 
in the labor market. So the question now still remains, is how soon before all those backlogs are worked through and there isn't enough new orders to support the existing workforce. What we're seeing is just a monster amount of backlogs coming out of the pandemic. It's still only now a matter of time before they're gone. And with that, will go the entire German economy. Employment fell only fractionally at the slowest rate in the current sequence of job launches stretching back to September of last year as sector level trends continue to diverge with greater job losses in manufacturing, which makes perfect sense, the most marked for three and a half years contracting with the fastest rate of services sector hiring seen in eight months. So yet there's this continued hope that the service sector around the world is going to be strong enough to pull the manufacturing sectors out of the hole that they're headed into. And yet we know that over time, what we continue to see is services sectors follow the manufacturing sector with a lag, it can be two to three months, sometimes a little longer, but it always follows manufacturing, not the other way around. And sure enough, we know what, what's coming in Germany is a mass amount of unemployment. As we look at industrial production here in the U.S. in blue against continued claims shown in red. And what we can notice when the year over year rate change of industrial production collapses and then when it falls below the black line, you see here on the horizon, that means it's in contraction. Well, that matches an increase in continued claims. And we'll look at the U.S. data here a little bit later in the show. But what we can note is a slowdown in industrial production production has been matched with an increase in continued claims. So as long as we see global manufacturing continue to slow and demand around the world fall, well, any hope of the U.S. labor market remain strong, well, is not very optimistic at all. And as we mentioned, that as German economy goes down, it pulls the whole Eurozone with it. Here we can see the Eurozone manufacturing PMI is down to 46.1, contracting even further from last month. And how about the services sector? Well, that actually is the bright spot in the European Union, up now to 50, showing unchanged from the prior month. But notably, you continue to see weakness in the manufacturing sector here. And when you have the largest economy in the eurozone go down there is no way the rest of them can stand without them as a seasonally adjusted flash eurozone composite pmi output based on approximately 85 percent of usual survey responses and compiled by s p global rose from 47.9 to 48.9 in february although the signaling a ninth consecutive month of falling output so even though it's slightly better than last month that output demand continues to go down. Is again, you start to see that it's just a matter of time before labor goes with this. And February's decline was the smallest since last June, while the latest reading suggests that the Eurozone's deepest contraction since 2013, if you can imagine, excluding the pandemic, has persisted into 2024. The rate of decline is showing signs of moderating, give, of course, those political elites some hope. But as we know, that if there is no increase in demand from somewhere in the world to drive the global economy, that all of this is is just a transitory slowdown in the midst of a much broader broader slowdown across all major economies. And here we can see employment in the Eurozone increased for the second month running in February after two months of decline at the end of last year. And while the overall rise in payroll numbers was only modest, the latest increase was nevertheless the largest since last July, again, giving people some kind of hope. But sector divergencies were noteworthy, a steepening rate of job losses in the manufacturing sector contrasted with net hiring reaching an eight-month high in the services sector. And this is important because, you know, everyone can say, well, look, there's a net change here. It's going to be okay. The one's balancing off the other. The issue here is the manufacturing sector pays far more money per worker than the services sector. So even though the services sector is adding jobs, well, it means demand for the euro zone is coming down and we see that today in their consumer price index data as we got the core cpi this is excluding food and energy look at this a massive 0.9 percent decline month over month bringing the year over year rate of change down to 3.3 how about the headline cpi again this includes food and energy down 0.4 percent for the month of january bringing the year-over-year -year rate change closer to, of course, the ECB's target of 2%, this now at 2.8%. Can you imagine what will happen 
when the U.S. data starts to show negative prints on a month-over-month -month rate? Well, stay tuned for a couple of months from now. I think we've got kind of a little renaissance period going on here, and then we're going to see the same thing follow as where the Eurozone goes. Notably, we see it spreading all around the world, even into the U.K., as a solid rate of services sector growth, notably the headline focusing on the good here, helps boost UK private sector output in February. The manufacturing output index is at 47. That's contraction. Again, anything under 50 is contraction. The smaller the number, the deeper the contraction. But look at the manufacturing PMI. It's at 47.1, a three-month high, which is only marginally higher than it was in January. Again, suggesting the problem here is manufacturing sectors around the world continued to shrink. Meanwhile, the services sector was unchanged at 54.3, showing a continued expansion in services sectors around, of course, the world, with the exception here of the Eurozone. But we know that, again, this is all about where the manufacturing sector goes. Employment then will follow along. And subdued hiring patterns were often linked to strong wage pressures and the need to reduce overhead, as more of the latest data suggested a lack of pressure on operating capacity, and here we go, with unfinished work or backlogs falling for the 10th consecutive month. It's only a matter of, again, a matter of time before these backlogs are totally wiped out and there's idle workers staying around, and then you're going to see a flood of people hit the unemployment line. And then you look back to the services sector and say, can these low-wage part-time jobs keep pace with these full-time high-paying manufacturing jobs? The answer is absolutely not. As these people in the manufacturing sector hit the unemployment line, their spending's going to plummet, and the services sector won't last. But now let's turn to the U.S., where, well, there's probably the brightest spot in the laundry basket here as cops pressures dissipate further in February, but growth momentum in the services sector, well, it softens a little bit, but it's still up. As we see, U.S. services business activity is at 51.3, still expanding, but at a slightly slower pace than it was in January. How about the manufacturing PMI now further in expansion? Again, this is fairly slight, but still it's a positive direction. And we noted that before, this is likely due to the Red Sea effect, as, of course, the more longer shipping times and higher shipping costs perhaps have tuned people into ordering for domestically here. What we can see is a manufacturing PMI up from 50.7 last month to now 51.5. Again, showing a bit of expansion here as goods producers signal the steepest rise in new orders since May of 2022. Again, what I'm calling the Red Sea effect as customer demand improved for a second month month running. Some businesses attributed this to clients having worked through their excess inventories, although I think it has to do less with they don't have the right inventories because we know inventory levels here in the U.S. are just way too high to begin with. Meanwhile, Service providers continue to see an increase in new business, albeit the slowest in three months and only marginal overall. So there's really the catch here is that the demand for a new order book is just not expanding at a pace where you would get the picture that the U.S. economy is indeed booming. Job creation was broad-based during February as manufacturers and service providers alike reported a rise in workforce numbers that will, of course, backfeed into the payroll report coming next month. The overall pace of employment growth eased to the slowest in three months, however, amid a less marked rise in services staffing numbers. Buoyed by stronger demand condition, good producers recorded the fastest uptick in employment since September 2023, while services firms highlighted caution in regards to higher but slower employment growth also reflected reduced pressure on capacity as backlogs of work returned to contraction following a slight rise in January. The level of outstanding business has fallen in nine of the 10 last 10 months with the latest drop solid overall, again, suggesting that what we see in the manufacturing base in the U.S. is nothing more than hope. And it's not driven by a strong volume of new orders, but what they continue to do is chew through these backlogs that we see just got built up during the pandemic. They're going away and going away quickly. That brings capacity at the factory level down. It ultimately leads to rising unemployment. But yet here in the U.S., we haven't seen, of course, unemployment jump too much of course, 
maybe as we get into the data, even the Fed's a little bit suspicious about it. But one thing that's going to be holding global manufacturing back is remaining is the central bankers who keep the money curve and yield curves inverted. And as a result, keep financial conditions tight and keep the banks from lending here. Here we can see industrial production in blue on a year over year rate change against the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes. And what we can note is that as that blue line goes down and slows and contracts, well, that coincides with the banks restricting the creation of money in the economy by curtailing their lending activities. We see that now, even though on net banks, fewer banks are tightening standards than before, it's still having an impact on the industrial base. And ultimately, that will backfeed to the labor market, as you'll soon see. Because U.S. jobless claims declined to the lowest level now in a month as applications for unemployment benefits fall to a whopping 201,000. This is extremely low levels. So this is actually giving us some evidence that the U.S. economy is actually fairly strong here, which makes sense because, again, I think there's this Red Sea effect where demand shifted from overseas factories to domestic factories, giving us roughly a three-month window, I'll call renaissance period here, if you believe these numbers. And they look pretty good because what we can see, even on a non-seasonally adjusted basis, they fell below 200,000, suggesting employers are indeed high hanging on to employees, which matches what we see in those preliminary PMI reports. But how about continued claims? They fell to 1.862 million, still fairly strong here in terms of a number. We have not seen a break over the 2 million, but that remains fairly high. How about the non-seasonally adjusted? That plummeted to just over just under 2.1 million. Total claims now, just about 2.171 million. So a lot of people on unemployment, and even though we're seeing the continued claims numbers drop a little bit, the issue is the longer someone's on unemployment, the less money they have, they have to make decisions to curtail their spending. And that is becomes the issue that it slowly eats into the economy and then happens all at once. But there's a problem here because not even the Fed's buying into this data. And this from Zero Hedge, if you doubt the accuracy of the Biden administration's data, here's what the FOMC minutes said yesterday, quote, while the recent trends prior to the meeting had been remarkably positive, Fed officials judge that some of the recent improvement reflected idiosyncratic movements in a few series, suggesting, well, they're not even buying it. And Zero Hedge notes, why would you when you can look at all the layoff announcements that we've seen and what are we not seeing it show up in the initial claims? And part of the reason that is it may be happening is just because a major company announces layoff doesn't mean the next day those people hit the unemployment line. There could be these are planned layoffs to happen over several months or quarters. They could be people getting severance packages where they cannot file for claims. There's any number of reasons that this could just hit all at once in the months to come. And of course, we know that this also is a factor here because as total compensation growth slows, which I think is the overlying issue here around the global economy, is demand is falling and so too is overall pay. As we look at total compensation in the form of average hourly earnings multiplied by average weekly hours of production and non-supervisory employees, that in red against industrial production, both on a year-over-year -year rate of change. And what we can note is slowdowns in total compensation line up perfectly with a lag into industrial production because as people have less money to spend, well, they start to spend less. And it makes sense. The only question here, based on what we're seeing in these people, PMIs, did we see a sharp increase in hours work? Because this is where some of the PMI data doesn't make sense. They're hiring and yet cutting hours and something's not adding up here. So maybe what we saw last month in hours work was just a one-off issue. We'll find out soon enough when we get the next payroll report. But for now, there's no signs of a big rebound in the U.S. economy. And of course, ultimately, as we see total compensation grow slow, that means the demand at employers is falling as well. And that leads to higher and higher continued claims on the unemployment side. And sure enough, we see the two of these lining up that overall, and not every time, but most times as total compensation growth slows, you see continued claims in blue continue to head higher. Again, giving us no indication that even though this weekly decrease in continued claims was nice, that it's going to last very long. But one thing we do think is gonna be a massive opportunity, and that is the stock for our sponsor, New Gen Medical. You can find them on the O2 
OTC under the symbol NGMDF and on the TSXV under the symbol NGMD. Let's take a look at what I believe is going to be a tremendous opportunity if you're looking to get in early on a company. This is one for you because they're revolutionizing needle free delivery because the future here is now as NewGen Medical Devices specializes in developing and commercializing drug delivery technologies and their products are designed to benefit and improve the well-being of millions of people worldwide who have the need for safe and effective drug delivery. What's key here is this isn't just for healthcare providers, it's for also for patients who self-administer. And why Needle Free? Well, it has fast absorption and action of insulin. It's portable, has an all-in-one design. There's no needle to get rid of. It's virtually pain-free. You can use it over and over, and there's no risk of needle stick injuries. This is incredible technology. And what can you use it for? Vaccines diabetes, veterinary, home health care. This is, can be used by millions and millions of people who need this, not only at the healthcare provider level, but again, for those at home. And this is incredible. And they are now even see an increase as two additional order sales for Insujet and expands their distribution into Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru. This company is moving. And this is where the opportunity for you is, my friends, because their stock is very Fairly new to trading here. The price is, as of recording was a mere eight cents, giving you lots of upside potential. And here you can see volume coming in right at the nine cent level here. This is a volume profile line since the stock you know, started trading. We see a lot of buyers coming in and holding that nine cent level, suggesting that what could happen here as we see new gen ship more and more and start making some, bringing in some revenue here, this could send their stock up very, very high. And this is your chance to get in early. Again, on the OTC under symbol NGMDF and on the TSXV under symbol NGMD. And as always, with any company we feature on our show, you're under no obligation to purchase their stock. Be sure to do your own research before placing any trades. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.